Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Multispeed Technologies, the Ask Noah Show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalaya. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off this hour. A faulty software update issued by the security giant CrowdStrike has resulted in a massive overnight outage that's affected Windows computers around the world, disrupting businesses, airports, train stations, banks, broadcasters, and the healthcare sector. CrowdStrike said the outage was not caused by a cyber attack, but instead the result of a defect in a software update for its flagship security product, Falcon Sensor. The defect caused any Windows computer that had Falcon installed on it to crash without fully loading. So, David Weston, who writes for Microsoft's blogs on Saturday, estimated that in 8.5 million Windows machines had been rendered unusable by this problem. Dave Weston, the vice president of Enterprise and OS Security. Flights here in the United States, grounded. People all over the country, and really all over the world, stranded for days. It shut down entire portions of the healthcare sector. It's being reported as the largest IT disaster in history. So what happened? There are two ways, and some of this will be review for some of you. Others, this will be like, oh, I didn't know that. So there are two ways in which software code can run. One way is down at the kernel level, or what they call ring zero. The second is ring one or user mode. So think of it like this. You have a collection of hardware, video card, processor, memory, motherboard, so on and so forth. Those are physical resources that you wish to interact with via software code. The kernel is what actually talks to those physical devices and executes code on them. Above that, as an abstraction layer, above both for security as well as a stability layout, is user land. User land is typically where you write your applications. And the idea is, in kernel mode, it gets access to the entire memory table. It has to because it has to be able to do things like allocate memory. Obviously, you don't want Joe Blow's software to be able to read and or interact and or disrupt and or destroy some other critical system process. And so best practice is to leave the kernel mode and the things that are running down at that level to the most critical operations. In the Linux world, that's why we spend so much time and there is such great emphasis on the team that works on the Linux kernel. Because if you disrupt and or destabilize it, the entire system falls over. User mode, on the other hand, is what we as users are typically used to. User land runs on top of the kernel, makes requests to the kernel. So if I want to store something in memory, I ask the kernel and say, hey, I need you to allocate me some memory. I need to be able to store this thing. If I want to run a calculation against the CPU, I go ask for time on the CPU. So the kernel has the opportunity to shut me down or tell me no. When there's an error in user land, the software crashes. So the program crashes. Now, I guarantee every single one of us has experienced that. When something happens at the kernel level, instead of just that software piece crashing, the entire system comes to a screeching halt. Now, some of you are going to say, well, that's a stupid design. Why would I do it like that? Well, there's a reason for that. When there's an unexpected condition that occurs in the kernel, because the kernel has such unprecedented access to the entire system, 
it shuts the entire system down because if it doesn't and the system were allowed to continue to run, you could irrevocably damage other parts of the system. You could corrupt files. You could corrupt the system. There's all sorts of bad things that can happen. And so however detrimental to the user experience it is, we try to avoid unexpected conditions in the kernel, but when they occur, the only thing to do is to shut down. Now, as you might expect, because of the tremendous consequences when something goes wrong at the kernel level, not just anything that can run at the kernel, it requires special permission to do so, and Microsoft indeed has a process for doing that. So when you want something to have access to hardware or run at the kernel level, that's typically what we would call a driver, right? And so Microsoft has what they call the Hardware Quality Lab or Windows WHQL certification. The WHQL certification is basically a process by which companies come and say, hey man, I want to run this driver and I want to detach the kernel and then I want to be able to talk to this piece of hardware. So an example of which I was dealing with a few weeks ago is a medical clinic that deals with imaging technology and they have a very specific hardware device that talks to the Windows box. There is a process by which Microsoft signs the driver basically saying, yes, this has completed all of the rigorous testing that we've placed forth and we believe that that won't cause any additional instability in the system. Here's our blessing. You may run. Past that, I don't know a lot about the process to get the WHQL certification. I do know it's more than just asking Microsoft and I do know it's not instantaneous. There is a process by which you have to follow. And there is a time by which that Microsoft will respond. So it's not an instantaneous thing. CrowdStrike, to their credit, applied and indeed got the WHQL certification from Windows as a driver. So even though they don't have any piece of particular hardware that they're choosing to run, they want access to the system level so that they can do proactive monitoring. So if you're not familiar with endpoint protection, I guess now's a good time to go over that. In the past, previously it was enough to simply respond to threats. So everybody that's worked in IT for more than five minutes has dealt with things like antivirus, where you install a piece of software and it monitors the system. And in the event, something that we know is bad happens or is discovered on a system, it flags it, it quarantines it, it does what it does, and then the administrator handles it. Well, today, 2024, that's no longer good enough. We cannot rely on waiting for something to be discovered. Then we identify it. Then we define it. Then we send that definition out. Then we update all of the systems. And then the systems begin to look for that process. That It, it no longer works because by the time that happens, bad things have already happened. And five minutes after that, there's something that's slightly different. So it no longer meets the definition, but it's equally as harmful. And so it becomes ineffective at best and a false sense of security at worst. So today, the industry relies on XDR and or anticipated threat detection. And so basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to predict what is going to happen and then we're going to respond before the threat actually takes hold. Companies desire to be proactive. In fact, one of our clients, it is a requirement of their franchise that they employ an XDR, uh, an XDR solution. They have to do that, extended detection and response in order to be able to continue to operate as their franchise. And it's not good enough to simply respond to threats. They have to be ahead of them. And when you're talking about companies as large as Delta or United or the NHS, it would be impossible for them to try to keep tabs on every single machine that they run across their network because it is all over the place. And so what they end up doing as a result is taking XDR solutions, extended detection response and endpoint management, deploying it to all of the machines and then watching for specific behaviors or contexts that alert the system to saying, hey, there's a problem here. In order to do that, it necessitates two things. So the first thing is you need API access of some sort to the kernel. You need some way to be able to monitor system resources. So if you find some, and I'm just making an example up here, some process that goes through and is encrypting 
hundreds of thousands of files. Well, what human being is opening and reading and then writing to thousands of files every second? That's probably not something that you do, right? And so unless otherwise specified, that qualifies as some sort of a suspicious behavior and we flag it. The second thing is the threat model is constantly evolving. It's constantly moving. And so as security researchers determine new things, and as we learn about the way that threats become presented, those threat models have to be dynamically updated. So it's not practical to have the tech industry say, oh, yeah, yeah here's the problem. This is, it looks like this and it does this. Oh, okay, well, let's go do and file a new update. Okay, now let's take that over to Microsoft. Now let's, now let's uh, take that back and have them uh, run a new WHQL certification. Okay, we got that certification. All right, great, awesome. Let's push that out. It's not practical. It wouldn't work. And so the way that they chose to go about doing this is with something called a channel file. And you can think of it almost like a config file that defines what we're looking for. So Microsoft had a couple of choices here. One choice was to create a user level API access that then gives access to the kernel and or the resources that the CrowdStrike Falcon program needed to be able to monitor. The second is to just let it run as a driver inside of the kernel. They chose the latter. Quote, as the tech industry deals with the fallout from the CrowdStrike instance, Microsoft is facing questions why its software like CrowdStrike is permitted to run at such a low level where a failure could spell disaster for the entire operating system. According to a report from the Wall Street Journal, a Microsoft spokesperson pointed to a 2009 undertaking by the IT giant with the European Commission as a reason as to why the Windows kernel was not protected like the current Apple Mac operating system, for example. The agreement is about interoperability and came as Microsoft was the subject of European scrutiny. The undertaking seeks a level playing field that includes the following clause. Quote, Microsoft shall ensure that an ongoing basis and in a timely manner that the APIs of the Windows client PC operating system and the Windows server operating system are called on by Microsoft security software products and are documented and available for use by third-party security software products that r run on the same Windows client PC or same Windows server operating system. In other words, Microsoft has to allow a third party the same access that they have to be able to monitor their system so that you can use a third party security solution instead of Microsoft's built in in-house thing. Here's the catch. The thing is, nothing in those requirements prevented Microsoft from creating an out of kernel API and using it for other security vendors to access. Instead, they let them run their CrowdStrike driver, their proprietary no insight to the code driver on the system. And so, yeah, we, I think we all get that you have to be able to prevent an attack before a formal de, you know, definition can be created and distributed, but this was not the way to go about it. So the Falcon sensor, you can think of it like a program that sits on the machine and is looking for suspicious activity as a driver. And to do that, it references something called a channel file, which I talked about earlier. You can think of it like a config file. And that config file gets updated from time to time. Well... Uh, evidently, that channel file doesn't have any sort of parameter you know, validation because it referenced a memory location that didn't exist, and that caused the blue screen of death. Now, worse yet, the CrowdStrike driver was set as a boot start driver, meaning Windows ordinarily, if it fails to boot after a certain amount of times, will unload drivers that it doesn't absolutely need, and it will attempt to boot itself. When it is set as a boot start driver, that's basically telling the system, you are not allowed to boot except for when this driver is loaded. And that meant that the result was 8.5 million machines across the world were stuck in a boot loop in which they booted up, hit a blue screen of death, shut down. Booted up, hit a blue screen of death, shut down. To make matters worse, because this is happening at the kernel level and the operating system can't get off the ground, the only way to fix it is to boot into safe mode and then go crawl in and delete that channel file. That means you have to physically touch every one of these 8.5 million machines. Even worse yet, because it requires booting into safe mode and going to find this config file and delete it, it's not something your average Joe can do. You gotta go fly the IT guy out to these places to touch all 8.5 million machines, but oh wait, 
Nobody can fly anywhere because the airline is coming to a screeching standstill. The worst IT disaster ever. Now, here's a couple of other really interesting facts, or at least I found them interesting. So, April 21st, 2010, back up 14 years. McAfee, similar situation. They have an update, and it deleted the SVC host.exe file. Not important, right? Causes a blue screen of death. Do you want to know who the CTO of McAfee was at the time? George Kurtz. Do you want to know what George Kurtz is doing today? He's the CEO of CrowdStrike. So, not once, but two worldwide disasters happen under the watch of a guy overseeing not one, but two different proprietary companies. I hope the confidence is building for you. So, going forward, the core problem isn't really a Windows problem. The core problem isn't even really a CrowdStrike problem. The core problem is that as technology becomes more prolific and more ubiquitous and more complex, we begin to rely on it more and we begin to push management aspects of it off to a third party. The notable example that I can give to you that you can watch play out every day in the IT industry, PCI compliance. Unless you're a masochist, you do everything in your power to move the burden of PCI compliance out of your sandbox and into somebody else's. That is a third party that we use. The data card data never touches our system. We never store it. We don't pass it along. Is 100% in their sandbox. Go talk to them. Why do they do that? Because you as the IT guy don't want that hassle. And so you hand that entire process off because of the re regulatory burden that comes with it and the security burden that comes with it. So if you're Delta or you're United or you're the NHS or whoever you are, you want to, as inexpensively as possible, hand off this gargantuan task of trying to do anticipatory threat modeling to somebody else who can do it. Because trying to do that in-house seems insurmountable. And yet, by doing so, by handing off the technology to somebody else, by refusing to take on the responsibility yourself, they all hamstring themselves to where they couldn't use any of their infrastructure. Collectively, what it means for us, we understand less and less about why a particular system works, how it works, what the underpinnings are, and the most important thing, how does it break and what do we do to fix it when it does? If Steve were here with me tonight, he's not, he's off doing red hatty things in, in, uh, in Raleigh. But if you were here tonight, he would tell you that it is the responsibility of every technician, every person who is a technologist to understand at a basic level, the technology for which they work in or which they support. If you're not willing to do that, somebody else is going to eat your lunch down the line because you're not the last line of resort somebody else's because you don't understand it, somebody else does. And so this idea, this fantasy that we've been living in, that you sign up for a subscription service and you install a thing and some other company will deal with it and magically all of the endpoints are just going to function, it's, it, it's just that, it's a fantasy. So, constructive criticism going forward because everybody can learn a lesson from this. Whether or not you had CrowdStrike in production, we didn't. AltaSpeed didn't. We didn't have a single. So we do endpoint protection. We didn't have any of these problems. In fact, I got an email from one of our clients who's an automotive dealership. And across the country over the past few months, they've gotten hit with a number of different cyber attacks. Our clients haven't been affected. So whether or not you're using this product, there, is, there are, are absolutely lessons to be taken from this. And the first one is understand your critical paths and have a disaster recovery plan in place when that critical path is affected. I don't care if you are a multi-million, multi-billion dollar airline with locations in every country known to man, or if you're a two-man shop working out of his or her garage with the shingle hanging outside the front house. 
you should understand your business and the technology for which you rely on your business for at least enough that you can continue to operate your business in the event that that technology fails you. There should be a recovery plan. I work with a hair care provider, major national brand, presence here in Grand Forks, and they use us as their IT provider. They have what they call a crash kit. And it's effectively a little Rubbermaid. And inside of the little red Rubbermaid is a binder with written instructions on what to do in case of a technical emergency. Additionally, there is the requisite materials to document credit card numbers or take cash. Then there is the requisite materials to hand write out receipts and log what happened in the event of a technical failure. So no matter what happens on the IT side, they can still run their business. Because guess what? You don't need a computer to cut hair, charge people money, and send them on their way. Now, I get it, right? If you're a larger organization, that isn't necessarily going to work. Okay. Obviously, Delta Airlines isn't going to be able to just hand write out, well, here's the here's the hundreds of millions of flights. It's not practical, right? To, to, to a certain degree, that, it, that, that only works because of the nature of the business. But cold shelf PCs, spare laptop, hey, if everything goes down, here's another way to get the endpoint. Again, presumably a lot of the servers and services that we were trying to access during this outage were up and running. Amazon Web Services were up. Now, funny enough, Microsoft had <laughs> this is a whole other rant here is different episode, I guess, different night. But Amazon or uh, it, Microsoft had an Azure failure almost at the same time that this CrowdStrike thing happened. So close, in fact, that a lot of people said, well, CrowdStrike must be running on Azure and that must be the responsible party for both. Wasn't the case. But presumably, a lot of the services that they were trying to access were up and available. The problem was you couldn't get into the endpoints because they're stuck in this endless reboot thing. So just having some basic planning on here's what we're going to do in the event of a failure keeps your business running. Now, Micah in the chat room sends in a question via Marlin and says, what about a standby lightweight laptop with basic logging software installed, break glass in case of emergency type $150 laptop? That's exactly what I'm talking about. In fact, we have clients that do this. In fact, we, I have a laptop that sits inside of a case and its express purpose in life is when everything else fails, because I've absolutely been to clients to where you walk in and there's malware or cryptoware or whatever where, and everything is down. I, I, we had it one time where it was a, it was a hotel bar. And the answer that I got from them when we got there and said, Hey, we need to shut everything down, clean everything and put it back in is what well, you can't do that. It will cost us a hundred thousand dollars every day that you have a shut down. And so the mandate from them to us was leave everything online, clean and restore a machine, return it online, clean and restore a machine, turn it online, clean and restore a machine, turn it online. Well, we got through about five of those before it became very apparent that it's like putting sick people or healthy people next to sick people and hoping that the healthy people don't get sick from the sick people. It's, it's, a, it's just, it's absurd. It doesn't work. You clean a machine, you put it back up, it gets infected 10 minutes later. And so we, we were, we're, we're getting nowhere fast. And eventually I walked in the general manager's office and I'm like, listen, either we're going to shut all these machines down, we're going to clean them one by one and bring them back up sterile, or I may as well go home because we're not getting anywhere doing this. And that's what they did. So in light of that situation, I now have a cold shelf laptop. It's nothing fancy. But the idea is it gets them online. And we were working at a food pantry of maybe a month or so ago and had their systems down. In fact, at that point, it was a cause of a network and brought in a little hotspot, brought in a little laptop and said, here, use this while we fix that. And their business was uninterrupted. So understanding critical paths, having a disaster recovery plan, if your size is bigger than your disaster recovery plan needs to be bigger, but have one. The second thing is, if you're a larger organization and having a little crash kit won't work, well, then your infrastructure is even more important because you know if something happens, you're going to have to fly IT guys around to fix all of these things. In that case, test on a small group of machines and then deploy to a larger set. So certainly a lot of the blame 
for this catastrophe can be parked at the feet of CrowdStrike. Okay. Even more so. <laughs> so even more so. Nobody thought to test this on a Windows box. Nobody thought before we push this up this channel update file to 8.5 million machines. Nobody at CrowdStrike was like, gee, guess we should probably run this on a Windows box. This is not some esoteric thing that affected some very special use case. As far as I understand it, if it was running Windows and it got this channel file, you borked the box. And nobody thought to test that. Then we'll add insult to injury. If you've worked in IT for five minutes, you know better than to push an update on Friday. Why? Because you're asking, you're asking to sacrifice your entire weekend cleaning up the mess. So you don't do stuff like that on a Friday. Twice so if you work at a church. Updates get pushed on Monday. Or Patch Tuesday. Not Friday. So we can park a lot of the blame at CrowdStrike, but there is absolutely some blame to be laid at the IT administrators who just blindly run updates without testing the software and seeing if it conflicts with anything. That's just poor planning. We don't have much of a choice in the updates that we get for our clients, but you bet your butt we test that stuff before we recommend the clients push things out. And if it's software that we've installed or we've deployed, like agents or monitoring or that sort of stuff, that all gets tested on one small client that isn't going to have a ginormous impact before it goes out to the wider audience. The next thing is, to a degree, I get it, you are fighting a larger threat model of trying to stay ahead of cybersecurity. That is to say, if given the choice between is the update going to bork the system or is the next cyber attack going to bork the system, odds are pretty good that the next cyber attack is going to bork the system. So if you have to choose between the two, keep your stuff up to date. And that's your, that is probably your best defense. But part of that and part of us as an IT culture teaching people to just always stay up to date, always keep things up to date, trust the most up to date thing, up to date is always going to be the best. If you're doing that, there needs to be some process to roll back those updates. Indeed, this is what the BSD guys have been holding our head over our heads for years. Hey, when something goes wrong, when an update breaks something, which absolutely happens on Linux, on Mac OS, on Windows, on BSD, everywhere, it happens. Have a plan to get back to a point of stability. Two bit in the chat room says patch Tuesday is, is a no go in some environments where I work. We push updates before or after patch Tuesday to avoid the blame game. So the same thing is true in broadcast, right? You can't do that during the day because there's stuff on the air during the day. And so the most downtime that you have is over the weekend where you don't have live and local programming. And so that's a lot of times when, so there's exceptions to every rule, but you have a plan for it. Number one, number two, the people who are typically doing those things are working only on the weekends. They're not running something on Friday and then heading out the door because every other business is going to be affected in the case of CrowdStrike over the weekend. The last thing is, again, my push is always going to be to use free and open source software. Visibility and transparency and insight into the code, into what is going to happen, into what did happen is paramount. And that would have, if not entirely mitigated the problem, at least significantly reduced it. It's important to note something like this very similar with CrowdStrike happened on Linux a few months ago. Why didn't we hear about it? Okay, well, one reason, obviously we don't have 8.5 million endpoints out there, but there are certainly millions of servers, like in the high 90 percentage, if you're running a server, it's running on Linux or you're a fool. And Red Hat advised that they, you, they, they sent out an, an advisement. I'll read it. Quote, disabling the CrowdStrike Falcon sensor agent software suite will mitigate the crashes and provide temporarily stabi stability in the system in question while the issue is investigated. The issue is observed but not limited to releases 6 and 7. So a number of systems are affected, but we have better tooling for handling these systems and these failures on Linux. Now, interestingly enough, Lenart Pottering wrote on Mastodon.social over the weekend, Systemd's automatic boot assessment feature 
can allow for reverting to a previous version of the operating system kernel automatically when a system consistently fails to boot. With the system boot bootloader and related tooling within the system D leveraging the bootloader specification, the system D automatic boot assessment would make this much easier recovery in case of an incident like what happened with Microsoft Windows systems running CrowdStrike software last week. So if you ask me what my takeaway from the CrowdStrike issue is, I'd say boot count and boot assessment and automatic boot fail-up should really be a must for today's systems. Before you invoke your kernel, you need to have tracking of boot attempts and a logic for failing back to older versions automatically. It's a major shortcoming that this is not the default behavior on today's system, and particularly commercial ones. And then he goes on to describe that while this system, while this functionality exists, it's oftentimes not employed and it's oftentimes not used or actively disabled. But the process exists and indeed this exact failure model has been anticipated and has been mitigated by the bright minds that work in open source and Linux. I would tell you that EDM or end, endpoint detection management and XDR extended detection and response are not just on the rise. They are going to take over and it is going to become the de facto standards already becoming the de facto standards. But in the next five years, it's going to become the de facto standard. We have ventured into this space with resounding success. I cannot tell you the look on clients' faces when you're able to call them, email them, walk into their place and say, hey, man, I noticed that XYZ isn't working, so I'm here to fix it for you. Say what? Yeah, your box is down and I have a replacement here. I mean, it's like it, you would think that you explain to them how somebody put milk in a coconut. I mean, that it's mind blowing to them. Like what? You're, how are you here already? Yeah, oh, we're here already. To accomplish this, we've been using Wazoo. And I don't have enough good things to say about Wazoo. Wazoo and Libra NMS, to be honest, is those two combined have been fantastic. Now, Wazoo is designed to operate primarily in user space, and they actually released a blog article, which I thought was very well written. I'll have it linked for you in the show notes of podcast.snoahshow.com. And it details why, if you were using an open source, free and open source tool like Wazoo to do your endpoint management and XDR, you wouldn't have suffered the problems that CrowdStrike had. Quote, unlike CrowdStrike, Wazoo is designed to run primarily in user space, and that eliminates the risk of failures like blue screens of death. Here are some key aspects of the approach that Wazoo uses. The user space operation, user agent Wazoo is run in the user space rather than the kernel space. This implementation avoids direct access to the core operating system and mitigates the risk of critical system errors. Secondly, the standard kernel APIs that Wazoo interacts with the operating system is using standard kernel APIs, and that ensures compatibility and stability without the complexities of higher risk kernel drivers. To summarize, the enhanced stability user agent or user space applications are less likely to cause system-wide crashes, providing a more stable environment. It also provides for easier debugging, whereas issues in the user space are easier to diagnose as compared to those in the kernel. And finally, improved security. Limiting access to the core operating system reduces the attack service for potential exploits. So I would take you back to the SolarWinds attack, where if you can compromise the supply chain, anything that the, anything that the software is installed on becomes compromised. And so with Wazoo, you're running in user space, so you don't run the risk of crashing the kernel, or if something is compromised, there is at least some limiting factors there. Quote, being an open source platform, Wazoo offers an ad additional advantages that help mitigate issues similar to the CrowdStrike blue screen of death incident. One is transparency. With open source code, it offers users and contributors the ability to inspect, audit, and verify the code base to ensure potential bugs and vulnerabilities are identified and addressed promptly. Secondly, community collaboration with a broad community of developers and security experts that contribute to Wazoo, enhancing the platform's robustness and reliability through continuous feedback and improvements. Lastly, flexibility. Organizations can tailor Wazoo to meet their specific needs, reducing the risk of unanticipated failures due to unnecessary or conflicting features. The most recent CrowdStrike blue screen of death incident highlights the risk of kernel drivers in security software. The architecture of Wazoo emphasizes on user space operations and standard kernel APIs, providing a safer and more reliable alternative. This approach 
provides security monitoring and threat protection without compromising the system stability. An additional open source nature of Wazoo fosters transparency, community collaboration, and flexibility, further reducing, further enhancing its reliability and security. So if you want to learn more, go to wazoo.com, W-A-Z-U-H.com, and you can learn how this platform allows people like me to find out about problems before my clients do. It's completely self-hosted. It unifies and historically separates functions into a single agent platform architecture. Protection is provided via public clouds, private clouds, and on-premise data center. So you can run it any place you need to run it. It offers threat hunting. It offers behavioral analysis, automated response. That's an important one because again, you can start saying, hey, if this threat thing happens, respond by this. And so a way that might look in practice is you can literally start telling Wazoo, start killing stuff. Hey, this bad thing is happening. Shut the machine down. Somebody turned it back on. Okay, kill the network access to that machine. Oh, somebody restored that or plugged it into a different switch. To turn the switch off completely and just start killing stuff and shutting things down. Meanwhile, firing alerts to tell the IT guy, hey, something's wrong. Hey, something's wrong. Hey, it's getting worse. Hey, something's wrong. And just keep the whack-a-mole bat popping down the threats until a human being can intervene and hopefully it's not a false alarm and so you turn everything back on and apologize. Hopefully that doesn't happen. But hopefully you walk in there and say, oh, great, awesome. There was a problem. Wazoo took care of the problem and or isolated the problem. I've now fixed the problem. We bring everything back up. And in the time that we've deployed Wazoo, we've had exactly zero, zero clients that have suffered a security failure or suffered a cryptoware, malware, any of that stuff to include places that operate in industries that have been ravaged by this. Not the least of which CrowdStrike, which <laughs> where the EDM, where the software that you put in to protect against threats becomes the threat. So focus your attention on the analysis, cut time spent analyzing telemetry from multiple security platform, pull it all into one place with something like Wazoo. I get a report every week in my email inbox. If there is a problem, I find out about it immediately, obviously, if Wazoo doesn't just fix it for me. And then past that, I just get a report saying, hey, here's where we're at. Here's what all the systems are doing. Here's, here's what's happening. And we have caught so many random little things that I, could, I can't sit here and tell you that, oh, yeah, this would have been a huge problem. Yeah, this would have. But I don't know that it wouldn't have been a problem. And it's things like, hey, Joey is running this ridiculously out of date version of Chrome with this ridiculously insecure extension installed. And Wazoo flags those things and let us know. And so that conversation with the client goes something like this. Hey, man, you've got this thing. Do you want us to come out and remove this? Do you really need this? Or do you want And 99 percent of the time? It's oh, no problem. We can pull that off the system. Not a problem at all. And then we keep those systems up to date and we know where the threat vectors are and we watch them very carefully. So zero problems with the open source alternative, half the world shut down with the proprietary alternative. You decide what direction you want to go. From the Linux Newswire newsroom, this is the Week in Review with JT. For the week of July 22nd, 2024, here's the Linux and open source news. Linux Mint 22 is now available. The Open Mandriva team has announced the release of Rome 24.07. Chaos Linux 24.07 has been released with KDE Plasma 6.1 and the Linux 6.9 kernel. EXT4 is getting some nice performance optimizations for Linux 6.11. And NVIDIA has finally started to open source some of its GPU drivers. Switzerland now requires all government software to be open source. In open source AI news, Meta has released a new open source AI model that it says rivals OpenAI and Google. And Grok's open source Llama AI based model has now topped leaderboards, outperforming GPTO and Claude in function calling. System76, the maker of Linux computer and Pop! OS, has big news. The first alpha release of Pop! OS 2404 with Cosmic Desktop Environment will launch August 8th. 
Carl Rochelle, founder and CTO or CEO of System76, shared the update via X earlier today. Quote, Cosmic is being developed from scratch using the Rust programming language and is known for its memory safety and performance. It leverages modern libraries like Iced for the GUI and LibCosmic for various functionalities. I would ask you to consider what other company is dedicated to the Linux desktop right now. I love me some Red Hat. I love the work that they do. I love the contributions that they give to the open source community. And they are, to my knowledge, the largest contributor to the GNOME desktop environment. So are they contributing to desktop Linux? 100% they are. I love the work that Canonical does. I love the fact that Ubuntu is the most popular Linux operating system on planet Earth. And spending time at Ubuntu Summit and spending time with uh, the, 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 the flavor distro people that are going through and working through, is there momentum in the Linux desktop? You bet there is. In fact, there's a renewed focus that I haven't seen for a while coming out of Canonical to get the Linux desktop up to par and to keep it running well. They eat their own dog food end to end, no question about it. But no other company is heavily investing in the Linux desktop as a first class citizen. They're, it's always something else, right? It's They're looking in the server space. They're looking for what makes them money. They're looking for, and those are all good things. There's nothing wrong with that. But their focus is not on selling Linux desktops. System 76's focus is on selling Linux desktops. And they hit a wall in which they have a direct line of communication with their customers where they ask about customer satisfaction. And when they hear that a customer isn't satisfied or there's a problem, they have a desire to do something about it and to address it. And as they hit one roadblock after the other, they eventually decided it was time to produce their own desktop environment. And that's where Cosmic Desktop came from. Now, Carl Rochelle did a interview on System 76's podcast in which he talks about why they started down the road of building Cosmic. Ultimately landed on on building Cosmic. Um, I think largely because we, we felt like there would be constant friction if we tried to do something like forking a project. We would always be working towards adapting that project to what we were wanting to build instead of just building what we wanted to build and always adding value. I think that's probably the core of it. So maybe they have a, a road to run, so to speak, to be able to go out and say, okay, well, we could just use GNOME or we could just use KDE or we could modify these things. But in the end, what they're looking to do then is attaching themselves at the hip to something else. By using, by developing Cosmic DE from the ground up, they are taking a clean slate approach of what do our customers want and how do they want to use the Linux desktop. They send out a survey for everybody that purchases a System76 computer to say, what do you like? What do you not like? How can we do better? In my eyes, this allows them to more directly address the things that people find as shortcomings. Additionally, as they release this on August 8th, and I'll have the entire podcast link for you at the, in the show notes, podcast.asknoahshow.com. It is an hour long, so you have to really, really care about Cosmic DE to go listen to it. There's some other stuff in there, too, but the, 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 most of the thrust of that episode is talking about the Cosmic DE and their development efforts towards it. A big portion of that is they are trying to skate down a path of here's what we know Linux users want, and so here's what we're going to do. And now that they've got it to a place that they think it's ready to ship, on August 8th, they're going to release the alpha, and then they're going to put their ear to the ground, and they are going to listen. They've done focus groups. They've done studies. They've done questionnaires. They've done testing. They internally have been running, I think he said, for like 18 months to try to create this OS experience that rivals Windows or Mac OS. And frankly, I mean, you look at the competitors that are out there. Framework, they make great laptops. My son has one. I have clients that have them. They work well. But in the end, 
you are loading and they're building a laptop and then you're loading an operating system onto it. Now they have the talented and well-dedicated Matt Hartley that is providing support. So there is absolutely a process for getting Linux loaded onto those laptops and it works well as long as you follow their process, which they lay out. But there's a process, right? With Pop! OS and with what's coming with Cosmic DE, they started from the standpoint of what do users want to see, what do users want to do, and then they work their way backwards. So things like displaying on an external display, pairing something with Bluetooth, changing set, all of that stuff has been ironed out. Now, part of that, that cohesive model, you would think, means that everything is in-house and one-off and isn't really following the Linux model. Not so. They designed everything to be modular because they themselves are fans of the modular approach. Smaller independent projects that you can put together into a larger whole. And so another one of the reasons we wanted to build Cosmic was that in looking at the landscape of open source projects, like the really successful open source projects are things like the Linux kernel, MySQL, uh, Apache, Firefox is one as well. I think Blender is really successful in that in this particular field. But most of those, maybe Firefox being the exception, but all of those have one characteristic in common, and it's that people can use them to build things with. And that wasn't a concept or an idea that existed within Linux desktop environments. And so we kind of took some of the, the concepts and the ideas behind, you know, the, the cyclist style of independent components and some modern UX and design and what we were, had already experimented with tiling and other things for our use. And we combined them all into a platform uh, that whose real intent, while it's a flagship for Cosmic, its real intent is to enable people to create OS experiences. So they recognize that there are going to be some people out there and they're very highly technical they want tiling. They want to never have to leave the keyboard because they spend most of their days writing code. Okay. Now I'm not necessarily a person that spends a lot of days writing or a lot of my time writing code, but I absolutely spend the vast majority of my time either in my email client matrix, a terminal or a web browser. And so I love tiling and I have become, I have fallen into the I three hole and I can't find my way out. And as I play an experiment around with cosmic, which I've been doing for, I don't know, at least a few months since Linux West Northwest, I've been pleasantly impressed. At the same time, they're aware that there are going to be students in a computer science department that have never used Linux before and trying to be only tiling would be obnoxious to them. And I was on the flight home from Southeast Linux Fest and I had Cosmic running on my laptop and I slid my laptop over to my wife and I said, play with this. And she looked at it and within a couple of seconds figured out how to click on the little button and turn off the tiling mode and go back to using a normal desktop environment. If I had dropped her into i3 or awesome or sway or whatever else, there's no way that happens. And my laptop just becomes unusable to her. And so they are, they have carefully thought through all of these challenges and are designing a system specifically designed from the ground up to be flexible, to be moldable, to be modular and to serve a wide range of audience that they know exists that wants the most out of the Linux desktop. So be watching on August 8th for Cosmic DE to ship and then do them a solid, download it, bang on it as hard as you can and give them polite, constructive feedback so that they can make the best out of their operating system. I don't think it's any exaggeration to say this might be one of the most substantial contributions System76 has ever made to the Linux ecosystem. That's saying something because they've been, they've been around for a long time and they were building Linux computers long before anybody else was. But I think this is a game changer for them. Image announced two licensing models as part of their new release, a server licensing and an individual license. The server license, priced at $99, covers all users on a single server, making it ideal for larger setups. On the other hand, an individual license is available for just $24.99. It's designed, on the other hand, for users who prefer flexibility, allowing them to use the license across any server that they choose. In light of this, we want to emphasize that there's a crucial point. Image remains free and open source. And just like before, the licenses are simply there to support the project. Not having them doesn't limit any functionality 
or feature of the application at all. So if you're not familiar with Image, it's a Google Photos alternative. It's a fantastic story of a guy who's sitting next to his wife and wanting to get her off Google Photos, but she just thought the product was too good. And he said to himself, self, I'm a developer. I will make a product that rivals and or exceeds the quality of Google Photos. And he did it. And it's called Image. It's incredible. The people that have started using it, one of which is a former Google fanboy who has gone all in on image and tells me to this day that the experience that he has on image is exceedingly better than the experience ever was on Google feature wise and functionality. Alex Tran, the lead maintainer of image announced that as of May 1st, 2024, the core team will transition to a full-time role under the new partnership with Austin based Texas community uh, company Futo. Futo focuses on aligning its own values, which is to build a better future for providing polished, pre format, and privacy preserving open source software solutions in a sustainable way. So basically, they want to wrestle control of software out of corporations and hand it back to people. Image's future has never looked brighter. We look forward to realizing our vision of Image as a part of Futo. So if you take photos or if you have a family member that takes photos and you want those photos to be backed up somewhere. Now I'm old school. I get laughed at all the time. I don't care. I, I wear it like a badge of pride. Uh, I take a, a, a cable and I plug it into my phone and then I plug it into my laptop and I grab all the photos and then I create a folder with the year and the month and I dump them all in there. And I've been doing that way since my original Palm handspring visor module that I plugged into my handspring visor deluxe and took monochrome photos with. And I've been doing it that way all the way up to my latest Pixel phone. And I will continue to do it that way. But for my family members and for people that I know that are wanting to get out of the Google boat wagon, this is a fantastic way to do it. So I highly recommend that you check out Image. I even more recommend that if you find value in Image, that you consider taking the time and effort and putting your wallet up to help support the people that make these projects a reality. Because if we don't, these projects go away. And the partnership with Futo is great, and I think it does a lot to get them to the next level and get their, their, their footprint off the ground and provide some level of stability. But in the end, they're going to have to cover their own costs or it's not going to work. From the Linux News... The music in my ears means we're out of time. I thank you for joining us. We record the show every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central at AskNoahShow.com. You can join us in the interactive mumble room. If you want to keep up to date with the latest, join us on Twitter or X. You can follow the show at Ask Noah Show. I'm at Colonel Linux. Steve is at Linux Ovens. He'll be back with me next week. The show, podcast.asknoahshow.com. There you'll find all of the articles and references that we use to create the show as well as the entire back catalog. We're back next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central at asknoahshow.com. Have a good week.